Hi everyone, uh, Katie from the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, uh, again with you this afternoon. Uh, today I uh, thought we'd take a look at some terminology, some that are um, a little perhaps new or uh, not always defined when we talk about them, um, to do with uh, excavations, archaeological excavations to do with artifacts and to do with some of the ways that we interpret the artifacts that we find. Um, so this is by no means a uh, full glossary of terms that archaeologists use. Uh, I've tried to sort of parse it down to a collection of archaeological terms that we use here in Ontario um, versus outside of Ontario versus outside of North America. Um, but again, there's there's lots that are not included in here. It's a, a very broad field with a lot of different uh, things coming into it. Um, so start us off, archaeology itself. Uh, Heather defined this a little bit last week in her, what is arch or obviously in her talk about what is archaeology, but that's archaeology itself, which is pertaining to past human life, um, particularly through the material remains. So that's the things um, that are left behind. And not to be confused with uh, paleontology, which is the study of past fossil or uh, past plants, animals, and other organisms that don't include humans, um, particularly through their fossils. Um, and we often get mixed up with the paleontologists. Um, dinosaurs are included in paleontology. Um, and fossils very rarely um, correlate with archaeology at all. Um, so I'm going to start off more specifically with some uh, excavation terms. And some of them popped up yesterday uh, with Heather. I'm just going to adjust myself here. There we go. Um, popped up a little bit with Heather uh, in her um, Who Cares About the Past exhibit tour. Um, a lot of this uh, is reflected there in that exhibition. Um, so the first is a surface survey, and that is essentially surveying what is on the surface of the ground that you can see without doing any um, special techniques of digging or fancy equipment to peek underneath the ground. Um, it is just what is on the surface. And that's often a very early cursory uh, view of what's there. Um, a test pit uh, is part of the stage two excavations that Heather talked about yesterday and is making small little test pits in a controlled way to determine if there's anything there without being too invasive into the ground. It's a little bit, um, you're digging into the ground uh, to some, in some way, but it's not overly invasive. Uh, the site is what you discover by doing um, some of these surveying techniques, um, which is the actual archaeological site itself. So we often talk about the site, that is anywhere that excavations have been done. Um, and they're usually confined to a specific area uh, based on the excavation plan and things like that. Um, formation processes are the human caused or natural processes that formed the archeological site. So that could be holes that people dug, walls that people built, that affect the um, the geo or the the earth in the sort of like the uh, the mounds or the um, the earthworks that are at the uh, site at the museum or adjacent to the museum the Lawson site. Um, so those are human and or naturally caused. Uh, excavation is that actual act of digging, and as we've covered quite a bit, uh, not all archaeology is about excavation. Excavation is a small part of what archaeology is, and it is that actual act of digging into the ground. Uh, archaeological excavations on sites are often um, set out into grids, which are further subdivided into uh, squares. Um, working in a very grid 
um, square pattern uh, so you excavate one square at a time um, and depending on where you are in the world here in Ontario it's usually one meter by one meter squares that people are working in um, elsewhere it can be six by six meters it can be uh, rectangular uh, quadrant or court tri triangular sections so it would be two meters by one meter and so forth so it depends on the type of archaeology that's being done um, and then back dirt um, I mentioned back dirt on our cookie excavation sheet, um, and it's that uh, dirt that we've sifted through. We are relatively certain that there's nothing of archaeological importance left in it, and it is discarded at the site um, and is often fills in the squares that have already been excavated as well. Um, and few types of archaeology is, um, that I'll mention here as well. We have um, contract archaeology and cultural resource management, which is, uh, again, what is being referenced in our Who Cares About the Past exhibit, is that archaeology that is done by uh, contract and is for a generally building on that site. So it's for commercial purposes or prior to the building of commercial properties. And underwater archaeology, which uh, Heather is going to be talking about tomorrow at this time. Um, that's her background. She's going to be going in depth into what underwater archaeology is and how it works. But it is the study of archaeological sites underwater. It is often shipwrecks, but not always. Um, and to move on to artifacts, um, we talk about artifacts generally uh, as an overall term for pretty much anything that is physical that we find on an archaeological site. But um, artifacts are a specific type of those finds in and of themselves. They are generally portable, which means that we can pick them up and we can move them back to the lab or the museum. They can be put on display at the museum easily. Essentially, they can be carried um, in, by hand. They're portable. Uh, there are also uh, features, which are those um, elements that are the same as artifacts, they're man-made. Artifacts are man-made or altered things. Um, and features are that as well. The difference is that they are not portable. Um, they're often walls or post molds. And post molds are those things that are uh, the dirt from the rotted posts, the base of the posts that get stuck on the ground or that end up in the ground. Um, so a feature is a human interacted portion of the site that is not portable. Uh, Ecofacts are another type of artifact. Um, the animal bones that we find on archaeological sites. This is a small jawbone from a carnivore of some sort. Um, those along with uh, plant materials, this is part of a bear tooth, um, they are called ecofacts because they relate to the environment, but they're not actually altered by people to do things with them. Um, they are altered through the interaction with people, but they're not altered by people. Um, so they reflect on the people, they tell about the people, but they aren't um, an object that they had and used and made. Uh, there are also all of those things, um, artifacts, ecofacts, they come together as an assemblage. And that's what I was talking about last week, Monday, Monday, um, about reading an assemblage as all the artifacts together. And uh, I believe that can include the ecofacts and the features as all of it together. And um, it helps us understand the site. Um, some of those artifacts can be organic. So that's materials that are made from uh, sort of living things, so they are animal or plant remains, and inorganic are those things that are not from a living thing, so rocks. Um, pottery are inorganic materials. And that brings me to lithics. Uh, so lithics is a sort of a, a branch of artifacts that are tools or other things made from stone. So lithic comes from the Greek word um, for stone. And there are two main, two main types of stone 
artifacts. Uh, so find one here. Here it is. Um, so there are ground stone tools, which are stones that are shaped into the form that they are used by grinding them with another stone. So in this case, we have an axe head. This is an abrader, and it's used to grind down and shape the stone into the shape that you want it. Um, so those are ground stone tools, and they tend to be quite uh, fairly large. They're fairly heavy, most often. Um, and then there are stone uh, chipped tools, or chipped stone tools, and that's like our, our, our spear points, arrowheads. They're made by chipping off little pieces in a very controlled way. So those are the stone chipped tools. And uh, they are often made out of flint or chert. So chert being the North American, uh, flint is, they're slightly different stones, but they're very, very closely related to each other. They're both sedimentary stones. Um, so they're made from um, the past compression of different layers of sediment being pressed together into a type of stone, which is why they flake. Um, and that is the term that's used for the pieces that get broken off or chipped off of the stone tools as they're being made. So this is a fairly large flake. Um, they are also, there's another term for a smaller flake, which is a microlith, so a tiny stone. Um, they are anywhere from about one to four centimeters in length, so they can be very, very small. Um, and those together, all the flakes and all the micro flakes that are chipped off of a stone tool, when they are scattered around an area, they're called debitage. So those are the small pieces of stone debris that break off during the manufacturing of stone tools. Um, the act of, or the art of making the uh, stone tools is called napping, K-N-A-P-P-I-N-G, and that is breaking off the uh, the pieces, chipping them in a very, very controlled way. Um, can also be referred to as flint napping, um, to put in the stone type too. Um, another, uh, two other words that often are used by archeologists are uniface and biface. And uniface tools or points, they're worked or napped only on one side, so they've only had pieces broken off of one side of the tool. And biface, is both sides of the tool. So they've been purposefully shaped and broken pieces, the pieces have been broken off to shape it on both sides. Uh, then uh, most of those tools, like I said, are made out of uh, chert or flint, um, but another stone that is commonly used for spear points and arrowheads is a stone called obsidian or a type of, it's kind of a stone, um, it is a volcanic glass and it works very much um, the same way as the chert or flint and is um, a lot of the same terms apply. Uh, to talk about pottery, pottery, uh, pottery is those ceramic pieces made from clay and when they're broken they are called sherds which is not to be confused with shards. So a piece of glass is a shard, a piece of pottery is a shard, um, S-H-E-R-D. And inside, when they break, this part right here, this is the fabric. Um, so we refer to that as the fabric of the pot. So that's the, um, it's essentially the material that the pot is made out of. Um, and the temper, you can kind of see it in this one here. Um, I have to talk about temper being added to pottery. This one might be a better one. So temper are the little bits of stone or ground up um, plants of certain types, cattail fluff. Um, things are added to the clay to make them stronger or have different properties. Um, so that is things that are purpose, those are things that are purposefully mixed into the clay to make them, uh, or to make the pottery behave in the way that the, the potter wants it to. Um, so that's temper. And I'm talking about some of the things, some of the ways that we interpret um, archaeology. So one of the things that archaeologists do is we put things into types so we can categorize them and think of them in larger groups. So that is putting them into 
uh, archaeological types. So pottery is a type. There's different types of pottery. And those are not necessarily intended by the original manufacturers. Those can be something that's just for the archaeologists or just something the archaeologists, or the way that archaeologists think of them. Um, and those are often determined by style. And the style is those differences of design um, and shape that uh, is found on artifacts. Uh, there's the two forms of dating, which is, or two main forms of dating, which is relative dating, which gives you uh, an overall idea of the date of something. Um, that means it could be narrowed down to a century, to a millennium, depending on the type of date, uh, perhaps a decade, uh, depending on um, the type of dating that's being used. And absolute dating, which is far more precise. So absolute dating gives you a very uh, much more narrowed down um, con or frame for the date of an artifact. Uh, context is the associations between the ground that the artifacts are found in and the artifacts that are with it and how they relate to each other from when they were deposited. So not changed over time, uh, anything that's been picked up or collected over time and has ended up in a collection like the one I've got here, um, which was part of a, or, or which all came from farmers sort of collections, those lack context. We don't know the associations between them and the ground and the other artifacts that they were found with. Um, and go along with that is a term that's often used um, called in situ. And in situ means where they lie. So if an artifact is in situ, it's where it was originally deposited, originally left behind, it is uh, in context or it can be in context. And that context is often determined through, or information about that context comes through stratigraphy, which I talked about the other day. Um, you can check out that talk a little bit more specifically on stratigraphy, but that refers to the layers that are in the ground that are caused through human and or uh, natural activities. And the law of superposition is the uh, idea of how those layers form and that the things at the bottom are older than the things on the top. And that's uh, borrowed from geology. It can be seen really well in uh, areas where there's a lot of tectonic plate activity. So if you look in um, mountainous areas, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, stratigraphy represented in the stone that you see, or stone um, cliffs and mountains and things that you find. Um, there's another dating type called uh, dendrochronology, which is tree ring dating, and we might do a talk specifically on that if there's interest. Um, that, that's using tree rings to date. Um, and that's based on the idea that the trees expand and they grow rings every every season. Um, I don't know if it says here for me how many times a year, I can't remember offhand. Um, but they grow based, those tree rings develop based on the environment and the nutrients that the tree has uh, during that growth cycle. And so all the trees in a given area will have the same pattern of tree rings and we can match those tree ring patterns kind of like your fingerprint ish um, in that uh, you can match them in a very similar way to another tree to an area to a time period um, if that's been determined so it's very useful for dating and is a type of absolute dating so you can pin it down to a very specific uh, year if you have the, the right information. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to mention is uh, BC and AD versus uh, BCE and CE. And this is a question that comes up a lot um, when doing tours uh, with school groups and others at the museum is what is the difference between BC and BCE, AD and CE? And it gets very confusing. Um, but basically, BC and AD are a religious context. BC means um, before Christ and is those years before the year one and counts backwards. And AD 
is an abbreviation for the term um, Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, uh, which is generally simply means Anno Domini or the year of our Lord. Um, so that is year one moving upwards towards us. So we live currently in 2020 AD, which is also CE. So BCE and CE are the uh, non-religious terms for these uh, separation of dates. Um, BCE simply means before common era and CE means common era. So 1 BC and 1 BCE are the same year. AD 1 and AD CE or 1 <laughs> 1 AD and 1 CE are also the same year. So we are in both AD 20, 2020 and CE 2020. Um, so if you see those and you're not sure what they mean, that's um, simply the secular or non-religious way of um, differentiating the time that we are in. So um, this uh, will be posted on our Facebook page as always and um, if you have any other terms that you've heard that you are not sure of and you would like a little bit more explanation of what they mean or how they re uh, refer to archaeology, leave them in the comments and we'll answer. Um, as well, tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m., Heather will be doing her talk on underwater archaeology. And there will be a kids show tomorrow morning, although I'm not 100% sure what that is going to be yet, but I suspect it's going to be very craft related. Um, and thank you very much for joining in. Bye-bye.